Welcome to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. I'm your host, Pete Mazzetti. My guest this evening is Bob Rader, who's the executive director of CABE. Bob, welcome. How are you? Good, good. And thanks for having me again, Pete. Good to see you again. It's been a while. It sure has. It and sure has. It's been a while. So, Bob, tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been with CABE. Well, I came over in 1996, which means I'm in my 25th year at this point. I'm the executive director of CABE, uh, and I help run the organization, obviously, uh, that does all kinds of things for school boards across the state. That's who we represent, and through the school boards, hopefully we help the students and the superintendents as well. Uh, We do all kinds of publications. We do professional development. We do advocacy in a number of different areas. And we try to help boards connect with each other because at this point where everybody's sort of in isolation, they need to talk to each other if they're going to use the best practices and even find out what the best practices are for running a meeting, for distance learning, and for other subjects that obviously have become very near and dear to us in the last couple of months. Absolutely, absolutely. And while, while, we're, run, while we're in... I guess this is the norm now for a while. How, how is distance learning going with CABE and all the school systems all, all across the state? Well, obviously, we don't run schools. We don't do any distance learning. We have enough trouble trying to run meetings from Zoom or WebEx or whatever uh, uh, we have to use uh, okay. to go to meeting as well. But certainly for districts, it's been a learning process. Uh, For many of the districts, the first two weeks were particularly difficult, and then we ran into the uh, spring vacations. Some are coming right back now or came back today. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that it sounds from what we're hearing from board members, from the commissioner, uh, from superintendents, that in some areas it's going very, very well, and in other areas, especially in our inner cities, there are many obstacles to doing good uh, distance learning uh, in our, in some of our school districts. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Bob, tell us a little bit about CABE and what exactly you guys do and who you are. Well, we represent boards of education across the state. We okay. we are advocates for boards of education. Uh, We do advocacy for them. We do publications. We do policy work. Policy work uh, is one of the most important things we do because every district runs on policies that have been adopted by the Board of Education. Absolutely. And and that, so it's sort of the local law of the district, um, but certainly that's what we do and that's what we try to uh, uh, help our districts with. We'll go down to Washington. We are at the legislature in Hartford. Uh, we develop relationships with uh, those who are helpful and sometimes not that helpful uh, to boards of education. And it will depend on what the subject is. And we will try to have good relationships with everybody. But when the pie is only so big, it makes it uh, somewhat uh, more difficult. I apologize. I had tried to to print something out, and uh, 20 minutes later, it's finally printed. Now it's printing. Now nah, don't worry about it. No. <laughs> oh, no, part, no. Of, part of working in this home office. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. So well, as far as how is the pandemic that we're in the, that we're experiencing right now affected Cade? Well, obviously, we're all working from home. We will occasionally right. go into the office, but only... Uh, at the most, three or four of us at a time. Um, We've seen this as a challenge to help our members. Um, What we have done is start some of the uh, uh, distance learning and distance communication for our members. For instance, every Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we bring all the board chairs together. that is one of the most helpful things we do. We certainly also have a listserv that they use, but when we bring them together, it's not only to provide them uh, what we think is the newest news (laughs) about what's going on, but also 
how, uh, what the best practices are, and we go out of our way to give a chance for them to speak to each other because right. that's the best way to learn uh, best practices. So we do that. Uh, we've done a number of webinars. One we did with uh, Dr. Mark Brackett from the Yale University Center for Emotional Intelligence, just helping people as they're going through this. But Mark is well known to our members since he works in many of the school districts, as well as having been a keynote speaker at one of our conventions. We also brought together the Alliance districts. They're the districts that are probably the most challenged. They are the most challenged in the state in terms of wealth and income and the difficulties their students are having. We brought them together with two, uh, the two co-chairs of the governor's task force on uh, learning at home. Uh, that's the East Hartford superintendent, Nate Quinnell, and Paul Freeman, who is the uh, uh, superintendent from, oh, geez, I just had it and I lost it and I apologize. Oh. Um, but, but he, um, Paul was very helpful to us as well. And that was a webinar that I think really helped a number of our districts. We are talking about disseminating information and uh, certainly uh, disseminating the books that the um, Scholastic was providing, as mm -hmm. well as the computers being provided by the uh, Partnership for Connecticut. Okay. Which now, what is, is the Partnership for Connecticut? Well, it's a group that mostly came about because the, um, the state uh, the Dalio Foundation, excuse me, the Dalio Foundation wanted to help districts that were uh, having more problems, especially with children uh, who seemed disengaged from school. Oh, so well. the Dalio Foundation worked with the governor and some legislators, and they set up this quasi-public uh, partnership that is, we believe, going to do some great things for Connecticut. And uh, one of the things they promised in the last few weeks is to provide 60,000 computers in the next three months to students who need them. I mentioned before that inner cities uh, have a lot of problems yeah. because there isn't as much accessibility, especially with, with children uh, whose parents may not have enough money to buy them computers mm -hmm. or where there's not enough uh, Wi-Fi or bandwidth or if if you're in a home like some are where the parents are working at home as well as the students trying to learn right. and there's just not enough uh, computers and so on. But the Dalio Foundation and the partnership have really uh, come together uh, to make this work. Oh, nice, nice. So, Bob, what do you think? Is school going to go back on May 20th? Uh, I wish I had the answer to that. <laughs> uh, what I appreciate very much is the commissioner, as well as the governor, keeping us up to date on their thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no uh, question from what we, uh, how this all started, that they look at the safety of our right. students and staff um, first, and that will be the, the decision, uh, that, that will be what the decisions are based on. Um, it's a very hard call. Nobody's right. dealt with this disease before. We know we are seeing um, some states in which there are people who really want to get together uh, and get, get back to work, and we certainly understand that. Our right. whole society runs on a strong economy, and if the economy is doing nothing, uh, we have to get it back. But Absolutely. I am very glad that the governor, those in the, uh, the governor and the commissioner, as well as others who are on the task force looking at this, um, keep health and safety first. And one of the things we're concerned about is what does happen whenever you get back to school. Right. We have a board member who brought to us the question of, um, so how do you keep kids six feet apart in our school buses? Yeah. How do you uh, keep kids six feet apart in our classrooms? Mm -hmm. um, what it looks like to us is that there may have to be um, 
double sessions as we've seen for other reasons in the past. Okay. Um, but I think this is the first time we've really seen it because a disease and because of worries about health. And that's to say nothing about the teachers and the, the administrators who also have to be in school and we want to keep very safe. Absolutely. Now, who is the commissioner? Commissioner is Miguel Cardona. Okay. Um, commissioner was a, I think he was a deputy superintendent. Uh, that might not have been his exact title, but I have known him for years, uh, coming out of Meriden. And okay. he's very knowledgeable about some of the um, achievement gaps that students will face, are facing, have faced for years. Mm -hmm. And certainly he believes, as do we, that the problem of inequity in our schools is going to have to be dealt with in an even more resolute and supportive manner uh, once we're through this. The kids in the, in, in the uh, what we're hoping is that the kids in our alliance districts, our big five districts, that's the biggest five of the districts, which they are all alliance districts, we don't want them to fall even further behind. So the next question we're gonna have to look at is, what do you do over the summer? Is right. there compensatory education going on? Is there the opportunity to catch up? Um, what is going to happen to all of our students? We're thinking about that, and we know that it is going to take, like everything else, uh, resources. You know, exactly. we, we've heard some people speak, and I hope you don't mind me keeping going, Peter. No, no, keep going, I'm, keep going. I'm sort of on a roll today, and okay. I'm not Go always on a roll. But um, there are some who out there who believe that schools will have a lot of money left over at the end of uh, June. Right. And the truth of the matter is the way the, um, the governor's executive orders, as well as the Federal CARES Act, um, came down, they said you have to keep paying uh, right. employees. So an average district, the, um, the salaries and benefits uh, just salaries and benefits for all employees, including yep. custodial workers, um, the administration, the, uh, the teachers, that usually amounts to 80 to 85% of the budget. Oh, in, wow. addition, in addition, we have to pay transportation costs. Each Absolutely. We're supposed to sit down with um, the bus companies right. uh, and figure out how to do that. Um, we're not sure exactly where it will end up in, in some districts. I'm right. told that some districts, uh, they only have to pay 80%. But when you think about the added cost from mm -hmm. distance learning and the need for uh, lots of work and professional development and, yeah. and not only computers, but also uh, training for professional staff, uh, we don't believe there's going to be a lot of money left over. In no, some cases, there will be some money, um, but then we know that the costs for the summer uh, compensatory time and whatever we're going to see in the fall will also cost a lot of money. Absolutely. Now, tell, now tell us about are the are the students getting fed during the yes, time? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, All right. School districts um, are very used to feeding kids breakfast and lunches right. in many of our districts. Yeah. Um, certainly we have continued to do that. Uh, food distribution centers have been set up, pick, pick up points have been set up, and we're very proud of the job that our staff uh, in our schools has been doing to make sure no kid goes hungry. It's Absolutely. very tough, it's very tough. Um, we're very proud of that. And years, years ago, Oh, when I first got into this business, we didn't do so much of feeding our children. But I think we all realize now that if we want our education systems to succeed and our students, most importantly, to succeed, that we have to make sure they have the support, if it means lunch, if it means breakfast, and anything else they need. And we also try to help their families when we can. Now, how impactful is this on, on our students? Well, it's very impactful. Um, 
it just depends on uh, where they are. Um, they're supposedly sitting at home doing homework and so on. Right. Uh, I don't know if it's always a full day for them. My yeah. wife is a teacher and she sure puts in a full day. Uh, but it's hard to do in that uh, it's very hard for the teachers. They, they don't have the same type of connection looking through a screen that they might have with a student right in front of them. Right. So that's, that's making it very difficult for teachers. Uh, we have seen articles from across the country um, about teachers who are finding this extremely difficult. And we sure want to make, uh, provide any support we can from them. Uh, mm -hmm. People obviously during this uh, epidemic have, have um, passed away. So there are people right. who are grieving. Uh, it's just a very difficult time. Hopefully we'll get out of it because of these measures we are taking, like working out of our homes. Right. Uh, but we don't know yet. And what would be the worst thing would be to start up everything again and just to find that we have to go back to a, uh, to a slowdown or people working in their yeah. homes again. Exactly, exactly. So what, once everything gets back to, let's say, gets back to normal, what do you think the normal school day is going to look like? Or does that depend on the superintendent and the town? It will, it will depend on a lot of things. It, it will certainly depend on what the, uh, the community is thinking, what parents are willing to do. Right. Um, you know, I mentioned before that, that we don't know what it'll look like going to school on a bus when you're six feet apart. Exactly. Uh, when students are supposed to be six feet apart. Um, we have heroic people doing heroic things now, uh, whether it's teaching our kids in this new, uh, in new environment and right. picking it up fast enough, hopefully. And, you know, it's very hard for parents uh, parents are trying to do their work at home while they have kids at home. Exactly. So we don't really know what the, the full fall schedule will be. We don't exactly. know what will happen uh, at the end, of, the end of May. Right. We also feel, and we also feel and have been talking about um, what it does to kids who are seniors and want yeah. to celebrate their graduation. And for some of them, it may be the only school they graduate. They may exactly. not go on to college, and even if they do, they may not finish. Um, and we want to make sure that remains a special time for them. So as right. the commissioner has suggested, we have talked to our districts about getting students involved in what would be the best kind of a graduation under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I just remembered something. Uh, Paul yes. Freeman is the is the superintendent in Guilford, and I apologize, it slipped my mind for a moment, but he is, <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. That's he is okay. a wonderful uh, guy to work with, and they're very lucky to have him nice. uh, in Guilford. Nice. So, nice. so getting back to, to graduations, yes. um, we don't know what. It will be uh, on the uh, computer. Uh, mm -hmm. What about proms and so on? We want this yeah, right. to be a very special, very happy time for our students. And uh, it's difficult at this point. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I remember when I graduated high school many, many, many years ago that we were lined, we graduate, if it's nice out, we graduate out on the football field at the old Morgan High School on Route 81, right on, right, right on 81. We were lining up and the skies opened. Oh, geez. So they basically had to stop the procession, load all the parents into the gymnasium, yeah. line us all back up again, and then restart graduation again. It's like, oh, well, it's memorable. <laughs> it, it, oh, yeah. a chance, and you had a chance to celebrate. Oh, and yeah. One of the things we are concerned about is some of these kids will probably never see each other again. Exactly. And we shouldn't sort of end it as, you know, well, that's the end of school. There it goes. That's it. Right. That's it. You're done. So your wife, your wife's a teacher, huh? Yes, and she is. Uh, she is retiring at the end of June, and it's it's not how she had even two oh. months ago thought about going out. Oh no. no she's she's working with her kids. She's doing all kinds of 
uh, Zoom meetings one-on-one -on -one when that's oh, appropriate, nice. and of course for classes, but it's a oh, different yeah. world. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What does she teach? She teaches chemistry. Okay. At Manchester High School. And, oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's been tough. You know, yeah. some of the kids, especially in the Alliance districts, um, we have had trouble reaching out to them. Uh, we hear they are not getting on the computers as we would hope. Maybe they don't even have computers. Right. So that's something that has gotten a lot of press attention lately. And certainly we know our districts are, are looking for good ideas, how to make sure they can reach out and work with every student. Absolutely, absolutely. So what else do you want to educate everybody about going on with CAVE? Well, you know, we're, we're trying to do the work that we always do, providing information, providing analysis. Um, there are a few districts who are not members and we hope they'll come back. We opened up everything in this pandemic to right. all members, uh, to all school boards and superintendents across the state. That's okay. something we've never done before, but we thought it would be helpful to them. We want every in public education to work together because this is a challenge like we've never faced before. Uh, we certainly talked to the commissioner, we talked to uh, the union, certainly CAPS, the uh, Superintendents Association, yep. and the principals, which is CAS, the Connecticut Association of Schools. We are also in touch with the National School Boards Association. Uh, they're, they've been sending out good guidance. Uh, we are sort of a, uh, one of their uh, 51 or so uh, different components, but we are talking to them a lot and we're, we're getting information uh, that they're providing, especially on things like the CARES Act and any interpretations of law and what the future may bring if there is more uh, funding from the federal government. Exactly. So we are trying to keep it all together. Our staff has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, we have uh, twice a week meetings. Uh, we try to keep everybody's spirits up, but they are um, so enthused with our mission that they understand uh, what an important role we're playing at this point. And I uh, can't say enough for them, for the boards and the board chairs. You know, when somebody signs up to be a board chair, say it happened in uh, November or December, right. they would have no idea <laughs> that this is going to happen. And the, oh, and absolutely that not. There would be a, a crisis like this. But right. the ones I talk to, the ones I see in our, our listserv, uh, the ones we hear at our two o'clock Friday meeting, meetings have uh, taken this as a challenge and they want to make sure their students and their communities see the best education they can, even under these difficult circumstances. Exactly. Is David Irwin still a superintendent? No, David Irwin, uh, he works at um, Education Connection, which is the Okay. Uh, regional Educational Service Center in the northwest part of the state. But David he is in touch now and then, and uh, he's a great guy. Matter of fact, David was the superintendent in Clinton. The last piece of the last graduating class that he graduated before he left was mine. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, uh, David. One David's of our, one of our staff members was also a superintendent in Cl Clinton years ago. Uh, in Mastaro. And, uh, you work Vin with Vin? Vin is still working. He is the best. Do me a uh, favor. You know, Next time you see Vin, tell him Pete Mazzetti said to say hello. A absolutely. Well, he does an hi. amazing job. And I was the New York State Policy Services uh, Director. He does it in Connecticut. Yeah. And I, can't, I could never keep up with him. He is no, just no, no. an amazing guy. And we're so oh, lucky. Great guy. Uh, we have him. He lives in Madison, and yep. uh, we think the whole world of him. I was going to say we should have you, him, and I on together next time. We'd love that. That would that would that would be fun. Be is fun. Joe Joe Cirasolo still around? Uh, Joe is no longer the um, executive director of Caps. That okay. is Fran Rabinowitz, but Joe retired. I get together with him now and then. Okay. I, he keeps uh, he keeps watch on what he's what is happening <laughs> and. Uh, 
Joe's a wonderful friend and a- Oh, he's a, a great guy. A great guy and did wonderful things for the kids in Connecticut. Because actually, actually, Joe was, Joe also was superintendent in Clinton. Of oh, Clinton, yes. So. Yes. A great breeding ground for great- uh, Oh, absolutely. Uh, superintendents and- Absolutely. And other, and, absolutely. and other works. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a little bit more time left. What else do we want to enlighten everybody about? Well, I just want them to know that uh, when we go back to work, one of the things we will keep working on is um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We think that's crucial uh, that districts are focused on, whether it's through uh, cultural uh, climate, they have cultural sensibilities to the students now in their districts uh, because the population is changing and we can't forget about, um, about that and what it will mean in the future. And that by itself is a whole session. Absolutely. Bob Ray from Cape, thanks for some time and we'll see you again soon. My pleasure. Anytime you want, Peter. Thank you. You got it. Thanks, Bob. I'll be having Bob Rader. I'm Pete Mazzetti. Thanks. Good night. And we'll see you next time.